Okay, welcome everybody to this uh, Ecology Frequently Asked Questions Graduate School Seminar um, put on by the CSU Colorado State University Ecology Program. Um, thanks for being here. We have some great panelists here today to tell you about graduate school and their experiences. Um, and so if you have questions during this panel, uh, please put them in the Q&A part of the um, toolbar down at the bottom of your screen and we will try to address them as they are relevant. Um, and just so you all know, this is being recorded. So just FYI on that, no one, none of the participants can be seen. We can only see the panelists on this recording, but just so you all are aware of that. Um, okay, so let's get started. So we'll start um, first by asking each panelist to introduce themselves, including their department and program, um, and then briefly tell us about their pathway to graduate school and what they are currently studying. So we want the panelists to aim for maybe three to four minutes for each of these uh, quick introductions. So Josue, why don't you go first? Me first, okay. Uh, well, I'm Josue Rodriguez Ramos. I'm a fourth year PhD student in the graduate degree program in ecology, but I'm housed in the soil and crop sciences department. And uh, let's see the questions. Briefly tell us about your pathway to grad school. Uh, I was an undergrad not knowing what to do. And then I was doing like a summer internship with like monkeys and rhesus macaques. And I like got poop in my mouth accidentally one time. And then there was a big virus risk for it. And then I Googled about viruses and I was like, this is pretty cool. So if I survive this, I'm going to like study viruses. And, and now I study viruses. And so that's my journey to grad school. It's very, yeah. I'm not kidding. That's exactly how it happened. And so I joined an undergrad lab with a mentor that was really cool. And he kind of nudged me in the right direction and told me what path he thought I should follow. Um, and so, yeah, I study viruses right now. Maybe not the ones that get you sick, mostly from an ecological standpoint, uh, being a germaphobe and all, it's kind of hard to do it otherwise. Uh, and then, yeah, that's, I think that's it. Great. Thanks. Uh, Gemma? Hi everyone, uh, my name is Gemma Fadham. I use she, her pronouns. I'm also in GDPE, but I'm housed in the Department of Ecosystem Science and Sustainability. And my path to grad school, I graduated from CSU with an ESS undergrad um, back in May, 2016. Um, and I had worked in the lab um, that my now advisor runs as an undergrad. And I had been thinking about grad school. Um, but I sort of pumped the brakes on that life decision for a little while. So I worked in outdoor education for a little while um, and then just so my brain got bored, I guess, um, and decided that grad school was the right choice for me um, and that I'd really liked the project that I'd worked on as undergrad and wanted to sort of explore that more and was supposed to go or was like planning on going to a different grad program, not at CSU and then um, like funding fell through. Sorry if you can hear my cat yelling in the background. She wants to come outside. It's a little bit incessant. Um, and then, um, yeah, so funding fell through on that program. And I kind of sort of frantically emailed the PI that I had worked for as an undergrad, kind of asking for advice, like, what do I do? I don't have a plan anymore. And he had just got funding for a PhD student and asked me if I wanted to come back to CSU. So um, yeah, came back to Fort Collins. And now I'm a fourth year PhD candidate. Thanks. Uh, Taryn? Uh, hey, all. Thanks for being here. I'm actually really excited to hear everyone's paths as well, because it's actually not something that we talk about on a regular basis with each other. So super interesting to hear so far where everyone's coming from. Um, but my name is Taryn, also she, her pronouns. Um, I am a second year master's student. So my home department is forest and rangeland stewardship, um, but I will graduate with a degree in ecology like everyone else here. Uh, my path to graduate school, uh, I graduated at my undergrad from the University of Arizona, actually studying agriculture in 2013. Then I did five years of field work. Um, it's one of those things that I really advocate for if you're interested in this field to do field work, but it is also something really easy to get caught up in and, and stay in and kind of feel stuck, which I hear a lot of um, people once they're their masters talk about. Uh, so I was actually trying to find a way out of that uh, 
loop for myself and getting a master seemed like the right way to go because it opens doors in your career. Um, and so that my path was really kind of just being involved in CSU. My partner is a master's student as well, or was. And so I was able to be around CSU and talk to different advisors and um, interviewed with an advisor who didn't end up being a good fit, but one of his PhD students became who my advisor is now. So it was an interesting, like just being at the right place at the right time. Um, and I am his first student because he just graduated as a PhD and became a professor. And then I um, am now studying willow regeneration, Iraqi Mountain National Park. Um, so I think that's all about me. Thanks, Darren and Emily. Hey, everyone. Um, okay, I also echo Taryn's sentiments about it being really fascinating soaring, hearing everyone's different paths. It's cool to see how different it's been for everyone. And I guess hopefully to the people listening in here, it sort of shows that there are a lot of different ways to get to grad school and there's definitely no one right way. So my name is Emily Stuchner. I'm a fifth year PhD candidate in Big Surprise, the graduate degree program in ecology, probably noticing a trend here. Um, and I'm housed in the biology department. And my path to grad school, I guess, was very regimented. And by that, I mean, I went to a small liberal arts college um, called Grinnell in Iowa. And pretty much it was like drilled into me from my first like, 200 level biology course onwards like hey after you leave here you should go get a phd and become a professor just like all of the people teaching you and that was very much just kind of drilled into people in my major and sort of told what we should do so i think it's been really cool honestly being at csu for the last few years and seeing how awesome it is that uh the faculty and the grad students and all the people here seem to promote a lot of like different types of paths and like masters or phd and you know maybe doing some work before you decide to go to grad school if that's what you want rather than really just kind of shoving that down your throat as the path but um, for better or for worse, I really did want to go to grad school and pursue a PhD. And so I started really intentionally trying to like prepare myself for that from very early on in undergrad. Um, that's not to say that if you haven't taken that approach, you still have plenty of time. Um, as Taryn mentioned, you know, taking time after undergrad to gain research experience. One, I definitely advocate for taking some time off. Um, I think that's a really great thing to do between undergrad and grad school, but I can touch more on that later. But also, um, essentially through my research experiences, both from grad school and undergrad, kind of led me to forming this network of connections that eventually led me to my current advisor here at CSU, where now working with him, I study uh, greenhouse gas emissions from soils in different ecosystems and try to better understand the soil microbial processes that give rise to these different greenhouse gases. Um, and I think that part of what helped sort of get me to arrive in a position that I've been so happy in for the last couple of years was really taking the time to sort of get to know who's out there and meet different PIs and talk to them about their research and have them sort of connect me with their friends and figure out like, okay, you do something cool. I'd be interested in working with you. So yeah. Great, thanks. And yeah, Emily kind of alluded to a lot of the main themes for this panel, which will be, um, you know, what is grad school like? And then how do you get, how do you get into grad school? What are some tools for doing that? Um, so we'll start with that first half of that. And uh, the first question I wanna ask you all is why did you go to graduate school and what new experiences can it provide? So everyone is welcome to answer, chime in when you have something. I'll start. Um, so I always really liked the school. Um, and then when I found out that you could get paid to do more school, I thought that that sounded like a pretty, um, a pretty good gig. Um, and then also I felt like an undergrad um, and the research experience that I had in undergrad sort of just scraped the surface of a lot of things I was really interested in. Um, so having the opportunity to go to graduate school, um, I guess I skipped over what my research is in that first question. Um, but I studied aquatic biogeochemistry, so mostly nitrogen cycling in tropical lakes, um, which was something that was like 
a topic in a class um, in undergrad. And so grad school is an opportunity to learn a lot more about that. Um, and then also I was realizing a lot of job opportunities were all seasonal um, with the undergrad degree that I had, which seems fairly common in natural resource for degree types. Um, and that's not to say you need a doctorate to not um, have seasonal jobs. I might've overcompensated on that a little bit, um, but just wanted to start building towards like a career instead of like job to job. Yeah, I, I um, agree with Gemma. And I think something that you touched on earlier, which is um, within field work, I feel like you play one role in the entire research process, which is this data collection portion. And if you're lucky, you get to do a little more of that. Maybe you do like uh, before field work where you decide where you're going to do your plots or how you're going to do them or what um, statistical analysis you would use in order to form the project. Um, but you really kind of truncate that entire process. And so one of the things that led me to go to grad school was the reality that you know, when I talk to the people that I work with, I would say, you know, aren't you interested to see like where this data goes and how it's used and like a larger implication or broader use of this information. And, you know, some of the responses were like, mm, not really, like, I really love tromping around the forests and collecting heights and um, the DBH, I can't remember what the acronym stands for, but the breast height of a plant. And that's like a lot of why people get into this field, because you love being outside. But if you get to the point like I did, and it sounds like other people here did, where you're like, well, what's next? What else can you do with this? That really was an impetus for me. Like, how can I, what's the rest of this process? What does it look like? And how can I delve in and, and be in control of my own project? So that was kind of the, Gemma framed it like you get kind of mentally bored. I think that's what I got to that point too, so. To chime in and dovetail a bit off that, I guess I would say, that's why I think if you have the opportunity or the time or the ability to seek out doing like research of any kind, whether that's volunteer, whether it's really getting into a lab sort of in whatever capacity you can in undergrad, um, it can be really useful for, I think, just honestly learning if you feel more along the path of just I just like tromping around outside and doing these measurements, which is awesome and completely cool and valid, or like, I really want to be at the point where I can do more and actually kind of work with this data and develop it into something or like, you know, actually participate in the research more fully, because I think um, I've certainly met people throughout my time in undergrad and grad school who have tried doing research and really didn't like it. And that's okay. It's just a good thing to know before you maybe commit yourself to a two to five year type situation. So I think that um, like any opportunity you have to try it out before you commit yourself to grad school and see if this is the sort of thing that you would like enjoy doing for an extended period of time can be really useful. I think mine might be the least streamlined of why I'm here. I, I, I'm thinking I was like the whole time I was like, did I actually know a single PhD student at any point in my life until the last four years? And I think the answer is no. I don't think I ever interacted with a PhD student. I had my, I knew master's student people because from a small university in Puerto Rico, I guess that's most of our population is master's students. And so I had a mentor, a PI, he had a PhD, but, and then he was always like, oh yeah, you should do that. You're good at this stuff. Like, and I'm like, I guess I should then like, this seems like it adds up. I enjoy doing science. I did a summer internship and I was like, yeah, I could see myself doing this for a while. And then I applied to grad school because it just seemed like the next step for it. But unlike most of you, apparently like I, I'm like data collection. Uh -uh, I don't want to do that. I just, I think, that seems like work and like, let's go to the lab and do stuff on a bench. Like, uh, I don't want to do that. So most of what I do is computational uh, and I use data that's been collected already, which is pretty cool. So I think that if anything, grad school has like a little bit for everyone, but like everyone here has said, you need to like, do you really want this? What exactly do you want to do? Do you need a PhD to be able to do that? <laughs> which that's a big question that I didn't never ask that. And luckily I was like, oh, okay, yes, I guess I do. But 
if the answer would have been no, then that would have sucked because I would overqualify myself for a lot of things. Uh, so it's important to consider is do you need this for what you want to do and then implement that into whether or not you're going to make the decision to go into grad school, I think. That's a great point, Josue. Thank you for that. Um, and all of you had great points. Uh, but you also brought up something that is our next question. Uh, what is your day to day like in graduate school, right? We maybe have a view of an ecologist as someone who's out in the forest dropping around, right? But that's probably not what most of us are doing every day. So could uh, a few of you speak to what you actually are doing on a day to day basis? This is literally it. This is my chair. That's my bookshelf. This is where I am every day from about 8.30 to 6. This is what I do. I do data analysis on my computer. I do a lot of computational things. I read a lot of papers. I try to write papers. I analyze data. Um, it's a lot of reading, a lot of meetings, and a lot of just kind of working through complex questions that nobody really has answers all the time for until you find a paper that did it 20 years ago. Kind of one of the cool things though um, is that as you move through your degree, I've at least felt like my day-to-day -day has really changed. So like at the beginning of grad school, I was, I felt like I was just running all over campus all the time. I was running to class and then I was running to the lab um, to like, you know, pipette some things. And then I was running to a meeting and I was just like, like the sitting at my desk thing, which is what I had kind of been like warned about doing a lot of, so to speak, didn't feel like it started to happen until after I was like finished with coursework and after my like lab work kind of started to quiet down. I guess actually sort of to Katie's point that might debunk another assumption about ecologists, which is that we inherently do a lot of field work. My field work happens maybe three days out of the year where I go out into a field with a shovel, fill basically a bucket with soil and bring it back to the lab. And then that's where the majority of my work happens. So I guess kind of to that point, it might be worth thinking about if you really enjoy the outside part of ecology work, making sure that you try to get yourself in a situation where you know that you'll be able to do that. Because sometimes it can turn into a lot of lab work or a lot of computer computational work, as Josue said, before you know it. Um, but yeah, then I feel like my day to day really has turned into a whole lot of computer and a whole lot of staring at my Word document screen. But I don't know, it's cool to feel like sort of week to week things can be very different. Like sometimes there are days on end where I sit and stare at a computer. And then sometimes there are days on end where I stand in the lab and like mess around with soil and jars. So it's cool that it's variable, I think. To be clear, I do and I, I enjoy my desk and my chair and my bookshelf. Like this is what I'd rather be doing. So you can find something for what you whatever it is you want to do. Because when I joined, I told Kelly, my PI, I was like, can I not really do any lab work? Because I'm kind of over it. And she's like, okay, what do you want to do? And I'm like, computational stuff. She's like, okay, what do you know how to do? And I'm like, nothing, but I want to do it. Uh and so she still took me in. And then now this is all I do. So you can also find areas to grow in that you had no real experience in otherwise. I wanted to actually that you you touched on a point that I wanted to bring up, which is for, for my day to day, maybe a little dissimilar. Um, I would say there is a lot of field work in what I do. Um, not currently because it's not yet summer, but I did my first summer like back to back field work. I was in the field from Monday through Friday and I could have been in the field at a longer duration of period, but I make my own schedule and I like to be home during the weekend. So um, it's definitely something that I chose this program because CSU has a more applied ecology program. So for me, I wanted it to be an on the ground type of work rather than be detached. And I think it's really works for some people to have that, like, I just have the data and I work with it and finding the patterns and understanding it is a lot more interesting. But for me, it's like, I need to see that the willows are like being eaten and then come up with reasons why. And then for me, I go like, I see A and it's caused by B, like that is a lot more tangible for me as a person. 
So I do do a lot of sitting at my desk now because I'm doing the analysis of my, um, the data I collected over the summer. But I wanted to touch on something that Josue said, um, which is that within grad school and, and maybe more true for a master's, like you don't need to know what you're doing. Like I think some misconception is that you're in your undergrad, you should have figured out exactly what you want your career to be. You go to your master's or your PhD and you're like, I know exactly what I want to do. And I'm going to tell you that I still don't know what I want to do and I should be graduating soon. But the important part about it is grad school provides a lot of opportunities to decide that. So I recently became the science communication fellow for GDPE and something that now I sit down and see what is my day to day and really ask myself, like, what do I accidentally spend way more time than I should doing? And then realizing that that's what I want to do. Like if I look at my analysis and I'm not excited about that, like maybe I need to realize that having analysis as a part of my career is not a good choice for me. But when I say like, I love doing outreach and writing about other people's research, like that to me, I'll do that more readily during my day to day. So I think looking at your day to day and and describing what we do is talking about like, what do we gravitate toward? You know, his way is like, I love being a computer. I love sitting here. Then that's what probably he should do for the rest of his career. But for me, I, I like gravitate towards something else. So my day to day is, yeah, I have analysis. Yes, I have my classes but I also have this other aspect that I enjoy a lot more. So I think, I mean, I didn't describe exactly what I do, but I described like a good way to look at maybe what you're doing now and decide what aspects of it you like. And do you want to keep doing that? Cause grad school will really shove in your face what you're doing. Cause you're doing it a lot um, more than you probably would do like in a job where you have more uh, different tasks that you're working on. Um, yeah. You know, I guess I'll add, so kind of similar to what Emily was saying about how her day-to-day has sort of changed over grad school. Um, I also really enjoy how I feel like my day-to-day changes over the course of a year. Um, you know, COVID obviously making some of it a little bit different, but on the scale of zero grad or grad school, zero field work to like hanging out with Willows five days a week. Um, I have about four weeks of field work every year. Um, it's because my main field site's in Honduras. So, you know, we like prepare for it, pack up, hope you don't forget anything at home. You know, fly down, do your field work, come back and do that twice a year. Um, so it definitely concentrates the field work. Um, but then there's a lot of sort of prep for that. Um, and then, you know, four months of analyzing the samples we bring back. And so that's always kind of fun to have like something like a trip to look forward to, something to plan for. Um, but then sort of the day to day tasks like lab work um, and writing and writing grants and stuff like that and teaching um, sort of in the meantime between between field visits um, kind of keeps it interesting, I think. So conferences, conferences are amazing. I like, It's such a big component that's missing from my life. Right? <laughs> but free conferences, you get to fly there for free. They give you money for food. Usually you meet people, you like hang out with people that are in your field. It's pretty dope. That actually is a really great point. There's some sweet perks that I feel like, uh, thank you for bringing that up, Josue. Like, uh, for example, I guess Josue and I both went to the American Geophysical Union in 2019. Um, I got funded to go by my department, which can actually be pretty common, which is rad. And so got to spend a week in San Francisco, just like eating and hanging out. And yes, like doing science, but it's such a great networking opportunity. It's so much fun. And I know there can be some different schools of thought about this, but like to Gemma's point where she's like, I get to go to Honduras twice a year. Like I get to go to San Francisco for this conference. Like grad school can provide those sorts of opportunities, like opportunities to travel potentially. And particularly if that's the sort of thing that like you want to seek out and make that part of what you do while you're in grad school. Um, there are a lot of opportunities that exist, like fellowships you can apply for to go as far as Antarctica sometimes to do research. So it's just cool, I think, to know that that like is an opportunity that you could have through these avenues. Great. Thanks all for giving us kind of a picture of what grad school looks like. So hopefully that informs our participants on, um, you know, what you'd be getting yourself into if you're applying for grad school in the first place. Um, And now we'll shift more towards, you know, what the application process looks like, um, kind of what what tools you can use for that. 
Um, and I will say that we are taking these questions from, from the questions you all asked on the registration form. Um, and so we're happy to also incorporate other questions though. So please use that Q and A function. Um, we'll probably uh, wait on very specific questions like to CSU and we'll answer any additional questions in email afterwards. So don't feel like if your questions are getting answered, it will get answered eventually. So just a heads up on that. Um, okay, so let's shift into applying to grad school. So can one of you or maybe multiple of you kind of go through the timeline of applying to grad school? What does that look like? I'm happy to take the springboard on this one since I, I don't know, I think I went a little extra on my personal timeline of applying to grad school. Um, okay, so the timeline I think usually begins approximately a year before the application is due. If we're just talking like sort of start to finish applying, the prep work that I guess you do leading up to bolstering your CV for applying can sort of be an ongoing thing, if that makes sense. And I'd be happy to touch on specifics more for that later. But I think kind of a year out, you need to start looking into the research groups of people you would want to work with. And frankly speaking, my strategy for that is like a nice old fashioned Google Scholar search of research topics you find interesting and you just start to find names. And at least my strategy was like, paper about something I find interesting, who is the lead author? Type their name into Google, see if they have a faculty page, see if there's any information there about whether they're even accepting grad students. Sometimes you will find a phenomenal paper written by someone who retired 20 years ago. So I guess potentially important to look out to that. And then comes the sort of awkward stage of um, cold emailing these people and being like, hey, my name is so-and-so, I'm in school here, or I graduated from school here blah, 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 your work is really cool. Here's my resume or something. Or again, at least that was the approach that I took. And the reason why I play this up since maybe this isn't what people you know, did when they applied to undergrad is making contact with a potential advisor is going to be critical to this process. And that's true for either the master's track or the PhD track. Um, essentially, you need to get your name known to a potential PI, I'd say in pretty much any case, at least definitely in ecology, um, because more often than not, that person is going to be like expecting your application when it like literally comes into the university. And if you just sort of apply randomly and say, I want to work with this person, they're likely going to be like, I've never talked to this prospective student. I have no idea who they are. And you'll just get that cold, harsh rejection letter. So um, like introducing yourself in advance and establishing like a rapport with a PI, I think will be really important. Um, and I guess I'll let others chime in about other elements. Um, so another thing that I thought of, so Emily gave like a super good description of sort of this like research track, because all four of us are um, research track graduate students, but there's also graduate degrees that are like professional degrees, um, which are generally like coursework followed by maybe an internship or something similar to that. Um, so to my understanding, at least within CSU, those deadlines look a little bit more similar to what you would have done when applying to undergrad. Um, and it's not always necessary to establish that sort of relationship um, the same way you would with a PI if you're doing a research track. Um, and depending on what your career goals are, um, those pre-professional degrees um, can also be like, a, you don't have to do a research degree for every sort of job, um, like the greenhouse gas and accounting degree um, is a professional track master. So you're doing coursework and internship um, with that. Great, thanks for uh, lining that up for us. Um, so Emily touched on this a bit, but um, do any of you have strategies for, for beyond Emily's provide strategy, which I think is great, uh, for finding research interests, an advisor, the school you wanna go to, these kinds of like, how did you narrow that down yourself? I, so I think 
cold emailing is probably the biggest one. When, when you say cold email, it's like just writing an email to some random professor that you saw work that looked cool and you were like, I'd do that. Uh, and then that's how it goes, really. Uh, that's It's funny because the lab I'm currently in was not a lab I was in really like aware that existed when I applied to the program and got interviewed at the program where I started my PhD at Ohio State but then they did rotations and then I rotated in the lab. And then I was like, I want this lab, not the one I came for. And so I basically ended up in the lab that I'm in now. And that's all in terms of like goodness of fit with the lab of personality types. There's a lot of things that kind of go into play, but with regards to like, how do you find somebody to email at all? Uh, I, I didn't really know how to do this, but then now if I could go back and do it again, I would have probably found my current lab if I had just searched for shit the way that I could have searched for it using things like Google Scholar. Like if you put like a topic in Google Scholar, you got a bunch of names and like you can use a lot of those names to start tracking down what that field that you want to join in looks like and who the big players for that field are. And so you just kind of start emailing random people. Sometimes they reply, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they don't reply and then you end up working with them. And then you're like, did you remember I emailed you and you never replied? And they're like, I don't even know who you are kind of Thanos person. Uh, and that happens and that's just kind of like part of like the whole dynamic of what academia is and I would argue that if you really care about a position and you cold email somebody and they don't reply just email them until they do it who cares they're what are they going to think of you that you're persistent boohoo that's great um I didn't want to maybe put like a master's lens on this because um, I think that for a PhD, like to put in perspective, like you could be with that person and that project up to seven years, like knock on wood that you go that long. But um, that reality means that your search and your decision making is a lot more robust into where you want to go, and what you want to do. Um, and I think for maybe a master's, it's a little less um structured like that because I'm not, I, you know, I'm maybe three years max, you're going to be with that person. So you have a lot less that you're investing into it. Um, and I also think a master's is inherently more exploratory. You're kind of figuring out, do I want to do research? What kind of research versus uh, more of the, I know what I want to do. And I just want to build myself in that area. Um, so for me, it was really actually more about location because I was already in Fort Collins. I knew that there was a great ecology program here and I knew that I wanted something applied. So I knew CSU was applied and I knew um, ecology is broad and I like that more interdisciplinary approach to um, like natural resources. So I didn't actually look across the country and see who was doing interesting research. I looked within CSU and said, what are different professors doing? What does that mean? I'm not really sure what ecology is besides like the general sense. So for me, I was really looking at what are labs doing here and it really helped to be in the place because I went to um, the Front Range Student Ecology Conf Symposium um, and got to see what people were doing here and then talk to them face to face. And I think that um, other people suggested even going door to door to advisors, which are PIs, which sounds super intimidating, but realizing that that's a great way. Even people that I didn't end up working with, it helped to talk through what research they were doing, how I would fit in, and then that helped me make my decision. So it is very uncomfortable and potentially talking to their grad students are is a little bit easier. You can find their lab page, you can see what their students are doing and talk to them if you're a little intimidated by talking to the PI. And that also gives you a good perspective into what that lab is like, because I think everyone here can say that your advisor is a huge part of your master or your graduate work. You need to make sure that that person's going to be the type of person that you want to work with that's um, really meshes well with you. So taking that time to not only figure out what you want to do, but who, and potentially for me, who is more important than what I did. Um, so just like a word of advice that your, your PI or your advisor is a, a huge part of it and um, making sure to have a good connection with them. I guess one other strategy I'd also point out if it just feels intimidating and or overwhelming going directly to PIs or grad students or searching just the entirety of Google Scholar, like take advantage of the 
professors you currently do have or the grad students you currently do know and ask them if they have any ideas or names. Um, like I was put in touch with my current PhD advisor by asking one of my research advisors as an undergrad, hey, who are some people you know about who might be interested in taking on a new student? And he sent me like five names, which was really useful. So that can also be a way to sort of help narrow down your search if it's overwhelming to just kind of like start with everyone. <laughs> Um, kind of related to what Emily was just saying about talking to PIs and grad students. Um, if you're an undergrad now and you're interested in research, but you don't know what type of research you're interested in, like that's also a great reason to be talking to, like you probably all have TAs that have research projects. Um, and if they're doing research that you think you're interested in, um, you can always seek out opportunities to work with them in their lab. Um, it's like, for example, I worked in a pollinator lab for a semester and then realized that pinning bees made me like super sad. Um, and that I think pollination is cool, but like that wasn't something that I was going to be happy with um, sort of as a research track. Um, and then just know that like if they turn you down, uh, it's like not to take it personal because sometimes it's just like they don't have funding to support someone in their lab or they can't pay for your lab hours to, you know, be at the bench. Um, so that's not like about them not wanting to work with you, but it never hurts to ask them if they have opportunities or you know, if they're going to have opportunities coming up like over the summer, or even if you want to like pick their brain, um, I'm pretty sure most grad students would like have a coffee with you or Zoom or something like that, um, if you just wanted to ask questions. All right, thanks all for all that great information. Um, so we're going to, so we're going to talk about two things right now. We're going to talk about funding first, and then we'll talk about kind of what a great grad school application looks like. And so there's some questions in the Q&A that, that are related to this, so we'll, we'll get to those, I promise. Um, okay, so first we're going to talk about funding. So let's talk about how, how is grad school funded? How, what are GTAs, what are GRAs, what do those letters mean? Um, and then someone asked a question, which Josue answered, um, in the chat, but could maybe you all could speak to as well. Um, you know, can you continue on a work to work a job outside of school, or do you need to work for your advisor um, when in grad school? And so, Josue touched on that, but if, if anyone else has any other thoughts, please please add to that as well. Also, sorry, I didn't know it would like remove the thing and be like, all right, this is taken care of. It's answered. I thought it would just kind of like leave it for everyone else, but I guess not. Um, I want to talk about this and it is, um, I think that it's really complicated. I think you need to realize that it is not as upfront. I had a friend I was talking to recently who said that she saw uh, graduate school as a job, like it was posted like that where she found it. Um, and so in her mind, it was like, oh, I'm just getting a job and I get paid these certain number of hours. And instead of like at the end of two years, just walking away, I'm going to walk away with a degree, um, which I think is kind of misleading because the funding is not as straightforward as I think being in a normal job where you, they would say, this is your salary. This is how much you get paid, period. Um, in grad school, your funding comes from a lot of sometimes piecemeal together sources. So I th think something to be really aware of is if you are talking to a potential advisor, you need to be aware of that funding. And if they say no to you or they say they don't have funding, it is not personal. And it's probably also a good sign that they're really responsible to say to you, I don't have funding and I'm not going to take you on. Because I, if you are a graduate student that's unfunded, um, and I'm talking from an ecology perspective because funding is very different across like chemistry and in other areas. So just be aware that when we talk about this, like it's really ecology based. So um, you need to understand that if you're going into a different area, that might be different. But so my funding came with my advisor. He got a grant that said, I'm going to complete this project and I'm going to fund a graduate student for four semesters. Um, and then within that, um, I had to TA for 10 hours a week um, and full-time TA is 20 hours a week and that pays for your tuition and a stipend. Um, and then I additionally got this fellowship with my department, which uh, filled the space of the funding that I would have been guaranteed with my grant from my BI. 
So that means that I had that funding pushed off so I can take longer to graduate if I want. But just being aware of that, my funding came from a grant. Other people's come from multiple grants and it's pieced together to form them. Some people have grants that don't cover their summers. So they're, they're funded during semesters and their tuition may or may not be covered. And then during the summer, they have to find their own funding. Some people have funding already in their grants for summers. Some people only have, uh, they have to TA full-time the whole time because they have no additional funding. So it's not just a job, they have the money done. Sometimes it's, we'll fund you for a year, we'll find funding for the second two years. I don't know if I'm making sense, but the point that I'm trying to get across is it's not straightforward and it, you, you need to kind of think through what's happening in your funding before you agree to it. Yeah, and a lot of programs I would kind of like highlight that like a lot of like departments and programs and stuff like have like required minimum graduate stipends like you're not like you are required by a school to get certain amount of money so that you can like exist in the space of graduate school and but it's like right like Taryn said like there's different pools of money where you can exist from my first year at Ohio State uh, I was fully funded by the university because I didn't even have a lab we were doing rotations the second year when I moved here with my current lab, uh, my PI had a grant and I was basically paid off of that grant. And that's a grant that they submit. You don't always participate in it, at least not in the beginning. But then afterwards, when you're more established in the lab, you might start writing grants with the PI based on whatever work you're doing. Um, so that was my second year. On my third year, I got a fellowship and that fellowship played, uh, paid for my stipend while I was here at CSU. Uh, and there's also like smaller pools of fellowships and, and like awards that you can apply for and maybe get. There's the like National Science Foundation, uh, NSF, big, I don't even, GRFP, which I never got, obviously. But like I know people that have and that's like something that people apply to uh, that are very highly competitive at the national level, but there's also smaller pools within like universities, like the Martin Luther King Jr. Advancing Education Award that's within CSU uh, that I applied for. Oh yeah, PI is principal investigator, not like a uh, private investigator. It's, I get that a lot. Uh, and TA means teaching assistant, GTA means graduate teaching assistant, GRA means graduate research assistant. That's, that's the lingo. But yeah, different pools of money, different places where you will exist from. And I guess fees are pretty important in graduate school. Like in addition to your salary, like you definitely have to pay a bunch of money for fees. And so before you join a program and they're like, you're going to make all this money, like think about the cost of like, well, how much am I going to have to pay with fees? How much is there my living expenses going to be? Because one of the cool things about a PhD specifically is that they're usually funded. You usually are somewhat maintained throughout the course of your PhD. And so sometimes you might get away with it without having to take out student loans, but factoring in things like student fees, factoring in things like living expenses, wherever you're gonna be are, are crucial to determining whether or not you should be doing a PhD because it can be financially strenuous for sure. I guess just one point I would like to clarify sort of amidst all of this is that if you are doing a research track, PhD or master's, not necessarily a coursework based one, your tuition should be covered. So like aside from funding and maybe the fees that you will have to pay for and all of those other things, like I just um, want to make sure that sort of everyone listening knows if people start trying to be like, oh, and you will pay for five years of tuition throughout your PhD. No, like your tuition should be covered. Same with your PhD, same with your master's. There are situations where sometimes that's only three quarters covered, but more often than not, like there's, you'll hear the term you're funded kind of thrown around in different ways, which can sometimes be confusing. But so in one respect, you are funded in that your tuition is covered like full stop. 
Um, some degree programs or some departments include covering your student fees in that. At CSU and in GDPE, we do have to cover our fees. And as Josue pointed out, depending on how many credits you're taking, that can range from really stinking expensive, although there are some really cool grad student efforts in place right now to try to lower those costs. So go CSU, that's cool, to slightly more financially manageable. Um, I lost my train of thought versus um, being funded in the sense that you either have this like patchwork of different grants cobbled together or as sort of as Taryn pointed out, or you have one grant that you're funded on via um, a GRA, basically with a GRA, meaning a graduate research assistantship, that means that you are funded through some grant typically that means that you do not need to spend time out of your week as a GTA or a graduate teaching assistant. But if you are funded through a GTA or a teaching assistantship, that typically means that you are spending 10 to 20 hours a week, 20 hours a week is common, um, teaching in some capacity as your means of getting a salary. So yes, it can be, it can be a complicated mosaic of factors. Um, and I guess one thing I would like to point out is that it is common for these things to kind of not necessarily be like perfectly mapped out from the get-go. And on the one hand, that's okay because grants come in and maybe your advisor told you when you started, you're gonna TA the whole time, but then they get a grant and then they're like, just kidding, we can give you an RA, hooray. Or other times funding doesn't come in and you might've been promised an RA, but then you will need to TA longer or vice versa. Or you might have to do different things one summer to the next to ensure that your summer financial situation is covered. And I won't deny that that can sometimes feel a little confusing and certainly stressful, but it does sort of seem like it can be an inevitability of these sorts of situations. But to that end, it does not make you pushy or annoying or weird to like hammer your PI about like, where is my money going to be coming from both while you're applying to grad school and then once you're here and always kind of just checking in and making sure that your financial situation is covered because I think that it will be important just kind of for everyone to make sure that you're being a good self-advocate about that and ensuring that you do have a source of money that's coming from somewhere. Yeah, I just wanted to like reemphasize what Emily just said about self-advocacy because I asked like zero questions. Um, I was super naive when I started grad school, mostly because um, like no one in my family even had an undergrad degree. So like, I didn't know how school worked um, really at all. And the thought that you could be paid like some amount of money to go to grad school was super exciting. Um, and then only recently I'm learning that like there's people I work with who negotiated higher salaries like in grad school um, because they had multiple offers and they talked from different PIs and they like are making way more money per month than I am. Um, and obviously it's not all about the money, um, but like my car needs new brakes. And so like a slightly higher salary like would be cool. Um, so yeah, like just what Emily said, like you're not being pushy if you're asking these questions. Um, and I get that asking questions about finances is like not inherently like uncomfortable for a lot of people. Um, but you're not like needy or greedy if you're asking um, questions about what your sort of financial future for the next five years is gonna look like. Um, so don't be afraid to ask those questions. Oh, and then also the JRFP, um, Jose briefly mentioned it, but um, you can apply for that but like as an undergrad um, before you're looking at grad schools um, and you can apply for that um, without having like a school that you know you're going to take that grant to. So if you get the GRFP, which is the Graduate Research Fellowship Program, um, you essentially take that funding and bring it to a PI and be like, I would like to join your lab and I can bring my own funding. So I don't know if that was going to be a question later if we're going to circle around to it. Um, but I encourage you to at least give it a Google if you're thinking about grad school. And um... I find this really awkward, but I also am really advocating for more transparency. So I'm going to tell you some physical numbers around what we're talking about here. So when we're talking about fees, like I think Emily mentioned on the low end is 600, I think for me is the lowest I've ever paid and upper end is about 1300 for fees. And when we're talking about pay, I get paid annually less than $25,000 a year. Um, and that sounds like a little amount of money, which it is, but it's also a consideration when you're looking at grad school because people do pay. 
if you're going to do a non-research based like um, human dimension of natural resource through the forest and rangeland stewardship, you're going to be paying out of pocket. So you're going to take out loans unless you are somehow independently wealthy. So just be aware that when we talk about money, it's we're really privileged because we do have the opportunity to walk away without debt. But we are talking about money that is potentially below poverty level. So you need to be aware that um, you're going to, it's going to be tight. It's going to be hard. And I want you to be aware of that. And actually just to sort of bring back one of the questions that Josue helpfully addressed in the chat, it is difficult uh, slash not recommended to try to hold down another job as a grad student. So that's not really an option. I think that sometimes people do think that they can supplement their, yes, very small salary um, with a part-time job, but you're going to be busy. There's a lot expected of you and it does kind of suck in a way that we work full-time hours slash very often more than full-time hours for a very small amount of money. And to that extent, it, you know, is a privileged position to be in, sometimes can be a position that requires, yes, taking out loans and having to hack it in ways where you might just have to feel financially uncomfortable for a few years. And that really does stink. But that is something to critically consider that this sort of will just be your source of income and it won't be large for two to five plus years. Okay, thank you all for those frank answers um, and, and accurately representing what, what it's like to, to go to grad school and how you can get funded and all of that. So thank you for that. Um, we are getting low on time. So if you have any pressing questions, please add them to the Q&A now. Um, we're now going to turn to uh, how can you make a, a graduate application competitive? Uh, what, what do you all think you need to have? And related to that, we have a question in the Q&A um, from someone who's not currently in school and it, it's, it would like suggestions for places to look for internships and experiences in ecology. And so perhaps you can tie in, um, in that into your answer. I think good letters of rec are really important. Um, and also you want to think about who's writing your letters of recommendation. So like your TA might know you really well. Um, but the weight of a letter of recommendation from a TA versus, you know, your professor who has a doctorate, um, like you'd rather have that letter of rec coming from someone with a doctorate um, or someone better yet, like who is somewhat known in the ecology field, like that would weigh a little bit better. Um, but that being said, um, if it's the end of the semester, especially now when semesters are online, um, if you email someone and you're like, hey, I was in your class of 140 people, can I have a letter of rec? And that person doesn't know you, um, they might just tell you like that they won't write you a letter of rec. And even if they do write you a letter of rec, it might just be like really broad because they don't actually know you. So I would say, you know, sort of think about those relationships and who you're going to ask for a letter of rec. And then, you know, it's okay to warn somebody like, hey, at the end of the semester, can I ask you for this? And like put some effort into cultivating that relationship and demonstrating your abilities sort of before you ask them would be important. And then to the question in the chat, um, one recommendation would be the Ecolog listserv, which you can subscribe to. Um, make sure you do the batch, otherwise you just get emails all day. But um, if you do the batch emails at like 3 a.m., you get a list of like 20 some ecology opportunities. And some of them will be like postdocs and whatnot, but some of them will be REUs, which are research experiences for undergrads um, or available um, like masters or PhD programs as well. Yeah, I think letters of rec are probably the most like important part of, or one of the most important parts of your like application packet. And I would guess like bigger names in the field might carry more weight, but if that person can't say anything about you as a person, that doesn't make it a good letter of recommendation. Like find somebody that knows you and even maybe cares about you. And that person will write you a good letter of recommendation because they appreciate who you are and what you can bring. and like most of the time when we do interviews for grad school in our lab, like the question we always ask is like, do, do you see like the fire? Do you see grit? Do you see the desire for a person to want to be here? And like, you'll have an applicant that's like super amazing in every sense. And if the answer is not really, 
then like that's it like on paper you can be everything but like even if you feel like you're like underqualified or whatever like who you are as a person matters so much especially in grad school uh so kind of use that to your advantage and r- make sure you find people who can write to that and about how great you are And somewhat along those lines, um, I think Gemma made a great point about considering sort of the weight of someone with a doctorate versus a TA, because yeah, academia is hierarchical like that. But I would also like to point out, if you um, do research in a lab, it's likely that you'd probably be working closely with a grad student. And so if there is a grad student who like knows you very well, also to Hoseway's point, likely, you know, cares about you and can speak to your research abilities and competencies and what sort of stuff you've done, that could sometimes be a better option than maybe the PI in the lab who hasn't interacted with you as closely. So it can be a case by case basis in that regard. But I really do echo Hoseway's point about just, you know, trying to ensure that you prioritize letter writers who are really going to care enough to put the time into making you sound awesome and passionate and driven. Um, And I guess another point I would like to add is, um, I guess as an undergrad, I tended to have more of a resume than a CV or a curriculum vitae. I feel like the CV comes more as you're a grad student, you can send a resume or a CV to potential advisors back to those cold emails. I always make sure to attach mine to that email and be like, if you're interested in learning more about me, check out my resume or check out my CV. Either one doesn't super matter, but I do recommend that you get someone who you know is like experienced and who you trust to throw a set of eyes on it and make sure it looks really good and really clean and really professional. If there's like a career counseling center on on campus, I think there must be Gemma's nodding, cool. Katie's nodding, cool. Bring it there, have them look at it. Um, And I guess be creative with sort of how you market yourself. I guess like if you feel like research experience is something you're lacking, I'm not saying lie, but like if you've taken classes that have lab work, that counts. You can talk about that. Like if you have learned bench research skills through your coursework, totally feel free to talk about that. Um, Study abroad experiences, maybe other jobs where you've had to like cultivate your interpersonal skills. There are a lot of ways that you can market yourself um, and just, it doesn't have to be only the pathway by being like, I interned in a lab, blah, blah, blah. All right, so we're just about out of time. Um, So I just wanna let you all, if you have any like quick last advice you would give to someone who's trying to apply to grad school like what do you wish you knew the location of the lab matters a lot and the person that you do it with might sometimes even matter more than what you're doing so even if it's not the exact fit for what you want your pi will matter so if it's something related to what you want with an excellent pi that's much better than exactly what you want with an okay pi because five to six years is a long time and if you're in a place that sucks or you're with somebody that sucks it's gonna suck a lot i would like to say that that still matters even in a two-year program (laughs) um but my word of advice is that i wish i had gone to grad school earlier um i'm gonna graduate when i'm 31 And I wish I'd done it when I'm 26, because um, I think it gives you a lot more opportunities. So just be aware that you don't need to make that decision right out of your undergrad, but maybe think about where your trajectory is going in your career, because I didn't think it through and kind of did it a little too late, in my opinion, from what I see others experience being. Um, I would say just reemphasize like asking questions about your financial situation, um, going to grad school. Like I love my research project and I love the lab I'm in. Um, and I am super obsessed with the lake that I get to work on. Um, but on the other hand, I have a TA every semester. Um, so by the end of the semester, I just have like no gas left in the tank. Um, so yeah, unless you're super psyched on TAing for five years, um, ask questions about your funding. <laughs> Gosh. Okay. My final piece of advice if you, you know, meet a PI who's interested in having you, 
visit. I know that it's hard with COVID right now. So like within the best of your abilities, but like, you're going to want to know what that culture is. Like what's, what is this uh, person's grad student like? What is being in their lab like? What is their lab meeting like? Is this a community that you want to spend two to five plus years hanging with? Because location really matters. Your PI really matters, but like it's the whole package, like the lab in the location with this PI, with these grad students, how does it feel? Great, thank you all. And so we are out of time. We thank you all so much for being here and listening in. We'll send out an email to all the registrants with some more information, um, questions we didn't have time to get to today. And I just wanna thank all of our panelists for sharing their wonderful experience. Um, we hope you have a great afternoon. Thanks all. <laughs>